Nathan, death is obvious, it's in inevitable as, as we know. Uh, what can a philosopher of biology do to uh, um, bring death into a broader context to understand it uh, maybe for better social reasons or to uh, um, use death as some vehicle to better make choices in life? Um, I think the philosophy of biology helped us understand uh, that death is a part of life. That's a, that's a cliche, death is a part of life. But actually, um, that, that has a deep truth in it. We are programmed to get old and die. All living things are. And the reason why is because a species loves diversity and a species loves uh, change to respond to a changing environment. If we are all the same, if we're all clones, or, or if we can't change, we'll live and die the same way and, and we would go extinct. So to generate diversity, we need new generations. But to have new generations, you gotta get the old generations out of the way. So every new generation is a new combination of our genes, of our genetic material, with the hopes that someone has the right combination to survive the next cataclysm. Mm. Because the world's always changing, the environment's always changing. So the best way to survive an uncertain future just like with your stock portfolio, you want to, to diversify. Mm -hmm. It's the same thing with the species. You want a diverse uh, set of individuals so that somebody is well suited for whatever the next catastrophe is. And those catastrophes do happen. So death is an important part of life. It's not just inevitable, it's important. We're programmed to do that. Now, of course, we don't want to die. Um, because what's good for the ant hill is bad for the ant. <laughs> it's, I don't want to die. I don't want to go away, but I do want the species to go on. So there's a lot of research into aging and that molecular clock that we've talked about. Um, and we might for the first time be, be close to extending the lifespan to a sort of theoretical limit. Uh, people think that's around 120 to 150 years, that it's sort of inevitable decay at that point. Um, but we, before that, we are primed um, on purpose to start to age into our fifth, sixth, seventh decade of life um, to start to get out of the way. Now, humans have a unique social structure in that the elderly have an incredible value in terms of what they know, right? And that's that cultural toolkit of knowledge. And so it seems like our lifespan was starting to extend already um, just by natural evolutionary processes. And now we're going to get um, sort of molecular medicine on the scene. And I think we will extend the human lifespan. I don't think it will ever be um, immortal. And frankly, I'm not sure I would want to be. Um, but, um, but aging is, is one of these facts of life that, that we should be comfortable with. Yeah. And what are the implications of that? I mean, if you extend human life, obviously there are ecological issues mm -hmm. and, and uh, social allocation of resource issues. Uh, I mean, it's, yeah. not, it's not just an individual decision. It, it, it has very broad impact. Yeah, that's correct. There's only so many people <laughs> the planet can support. Um, the carrying capacity, and people are debating what the comparing, uh, the carrying capacity of planet Earth is for humans. Um, I'm not particularly worried that we're near it yet uh, because there's a lot more we can do to bring technology on the scene. Um, the problem is that it's never going to be allocated equally. And in fact, uh, right now, resource allocation on the planet is as unequal as it could possibly, as it's ever been, maybe as, as much as it could possibly be. Um, so we're going to have to solve that problem. Um, I think, though, that birth rates are declining in pretty much every demographic. They're starting to, uh, even in the, in the most prolific demographics. And so um, as birth rates come down, this becomes less of a pressing issue. Um, but what, what biological death represents is change and is the capacity for change. And I think humans have a natural sense that part of what makes our life special is that it doesn't last forever. Mm. You know, that's what, uh, you know, just, you're gonna wake up for another mm. day. I mean, after the first few billion years, mm. doesn't that get a little old? <laughs> um, so I, some, the, I, the finite nature of life is kind of what makes it special. If every mo moment was special, there's no special moments. Mm. And so I think um, that we will come more to terms with it, um, especially if we're living more health, more healthful lives. Um, uh, for the first hundred years or so. Um, we'll see. The ideal is, is that we will live very long, healthy lives and then suddenly mm -hmm. drop as opposed to a gradual unhealthiness and then do, mm -hmm. having decades of poor health and then, and then die. Right. Decades of robust health and then suddenly die. I think that would be preferable. <laughs> um, most people would, would agree with that. Um, and interestingly, in our, in our ancestral life, uh, death was more spread out through the lifespan. So mm -hmm. you did have some very old individuals, but they got that way by being lucky. Yeah. <laughs> and so I think what we'd like to see 
um, is to is to live more, as you said, more healthy lives through the lifespan, um, and then you reach start to reach that theoretical maximum. Um, that seems to be something that's at least accomplishable because inflammation, the process of inflammation, we're starting to understand is at the root of a lot of aging related diseases. Importantly, this is key, um, if we can solve the problem of inflammation, it doesn't solve the problem of aging. So it, it could to, you know, help us get towards that theoretical maximum while being healthy along the way. And I think that's the kind of finite mortality that most of us would, would enjoy living.